The Irish have had a really impressive stretch at running back over the past five years, but is Audric Estime ready to be an elite back? Plus, how concerned should we be about the inexperience behind him? All that more on this edition of Locked On Irish. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on and welcome into another edition of Locked On Irish. It is Wednesday, June 14th, and thank you for making this your first listen of the day. Whether you're watching along on YouTube or listening on your favorite podcast platform, I appreciate you joining me here today. But please subscribe to the show if you have not already. I'm your host, Tyler Wojak. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018. I've been podcasting about the football team since 2020, and I'm a producer for College Football Town at the Fox Sports headquarters in L.A. Today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash college, and when you enter promo code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE, they'll throw in a free Yeti-style tumbler with every order. In today's episode, we're going to do a deep dive on the Notre Dame running back room, and no, this is not a position preview. I think those are pretty boring, personally. So instead, I'm going to take a look at how Notre Dame has managed the position over the past five years through recruiting in the transfer portal and then evaluate the results on the field. Plus, I'm going to predict what the future might look like for the guys toting the rock in the blue and gold in segment three. I did this a couple weeks ago with the quarterbacks, and I'll continue to do this with each position group throughout the summer. I think it's a good way to analyze how Notre Dame goes about constructing their roster and figure out which position groups are trending up and which position groups are trending down. For example, if I had done this exercise a couple years ago with the wide receivers, it would have been pretty easy to figure out, hey, whatever's going on here in this room, it's not cutting it. And it's probably going to come back to bite us here pretty soon. And that's exactly what happened in 2022 because Notre Dame had like six scholarship receivers. They couldn't even run like a scrimmage in practice without wearing out all the guys. So I think it's a good way to fact check how fans might think about a position or a position coach as well and compare that to reality. So with that in mind, let's take a look back at how Notre Dame has recruited running back since 2019. And to be honest, on paper, it's really not that great. But honestly, I think they hit on pretty much every single guy they've recruited. Let's go back and look at it. In 2019, they signed a four-star named Kyron Williams out of St. Louis, Missouri. I think that one was a hit, okay? Nearly 3,000 yards in scrimmage, over uh, 2,000 rushing yards in his career, 27 touchdowns on the ground. One of my favorite players, uh, certainly in recent history for Notre Dame, but I think, honestly, one of my favorite players to watch play for Notre Dame throughout my lifetime. He was just an absolute dog and such a great player on some really great Notre Dame teams. So he uh, he was a hit. Then we go to 2020, and if you think about it, when Notre Dame signed four star Chris Tyree, Tyree was supposed to be everything that Kyron Williams Williams uh, ended up being. He's a little bit undersized. Tyree was a much higher rated prospect than Kyron Williams was. He was number 70 nationally and the number one all-purpose back in the country. Um, he's from Virginia, and he picked Notre Dame over Alabama and Oklahoma. That same season, Notre Dame added transfer Trevor Spates, but it didn't really work out for him at Notre Dame. So if you look at it, in 2019 and 2020, Notre Dame was only signing one running back per class. That all changed in 2021, although they did put all their ba- or put all their eggs in the Will Shipley basket, the five-star who ultimately decided to go to Clemson. I remember his recruitment pretty well. Notre Dame did everything. They made him the focus of almost the entire recruiting class. They went all in on him, and he was honestly like the perfect Notre Dame type of player. Not only was he really talented on the field, he you know checked off every single box off the field. And I know that after Notre Dame sort of dominated Clemson last season, everyone was like, oh, well, Notre Dame lucked out by not getting Will Shipley. Let's let's not get it twisted. Like It would have been great to have Will Shipley on the team last year and certainly on the team this year. So even though Notre Dame did swing and miss on Will Shipley, they signed Audric Estime and Logan Diggs in that class. We'll get to Diggs in a second, but let's talk about Estime first. So he was the number 231 player nationally, number 13 running back in the class, and was actually committed to Michigan State throughout much of that fall in 2020, but then he decommitted right before signing day and picked Notre Dame. And then Diggs, meanwhile... He was really not recruited that highly, to be honest. Not even from his own school in his hometown state of Louisiana. He was a fringe top 500 prospect in the class, the number 35 running back, and he committed to Notre Dame in July of 2020. LSU ended up offering him a week before signing day, uh, and he actually signed his national letter of intent to Notre Dame but tried to get out of it uh, to go to LSU. It didn't work out, so he ended up going to Notre Dame, and then we all know what happened from there. Uh, There was also rumors that he was going to transfer after his freshman season when he really came on at the end of the year and impressed. He had that play against Virginia where he hurdled that guy, and I think a lot of people were really excited about him. 
Sophomore season was pretty weird, honestly, especially at the beginning. He was a DNP against Cal. They said it was an injury. We didn't really know. Audrey Estime was kind of taking that role of the lead back. But then he really finished strong, and he was, you know, 1B to Audrey Estime's 1A. So even though Diggs ended up transferring, I think you got to call him a hit, to be honest with you, because he still did produce enough at Notre Dame for, for it to warrant a hit, in my opinion. I know that he's certainly not a fan favorite right now, especially considering the fact that he went to LSU, which is where Brian Kelly coaches. Um, still, from an evaluation standpoint, it was a hit. So then we get to 2022, and Notre Dame signed four-star Jadarian Price and four-star Jabron Payne. Now, this was obviously an interesting class because um, Dylan McCullough sort of came on after signing day, or at least after the first early signing day. So Jadarian Price was the first running back to commit in the class. Um, at the time of his commitment, he was grossly underrated, especially considering the type of monstrous senior season he ended up having. And the funny thing about his uh, recruitment and so many other weird recruitments that were going on during 2020 uh, Jadarian Price actually released a top eight list of schools in December of 2020, and Notre Dame wasn't even on it. Uh, then he committed to Notre Dame two months later. It was quite the surge from the Lance Taylor and the Irish. Um, he ends up committing to Notre Dame, and for a while there, he was going to be the only running back in the class. Notre Dame really went after five-star Nick Singleton, and depending on who you ask, he was actually a silent commit to Notre Dame at one point. Um, from what I've read and some other stuff that I've heard, it sounded like Nick Singleton was ready to commit to Notre Dame right after his official visit. His dad convinced him to wait. He ended up going to Penn State, and he's already one of the best running backs in the entire country. So that was a big miss for Notre Dame, but they're able to get Jadarian Price in this class. And then very late in the game, they added four-star Jabron Payne. Once Steele McCullough came on for Lance Taylor, uh, he made it a priority to get Payne because Payne was actually committed to Indiana, which is where Dylan McCullough had coached uh, in the years prior to coming over to Notre Dame. And, you know, Payne's high school career was pretty interesting because he went to a big-time program called LaSalle in Cincinnati, Ohio, very good football powerhouse, and he really burst out of the scene as a sophomore. And then his junior and senior seasons were kind of riddled with injuries, so that hurt his stock. But it's still... He was uh, the number 25 running back in the class that year, so it was a nice add. He uh, came into the class in like April of that year, so well after signing day, so it was great that Notre Dame was able to land him, and that was another year where they signed two running backs in the class. Then we get to 2023, Dylan McCall's first full class as a, the running backs coach. So he only signed one running back out of high school, four-star Jeremiah Love, and boy, did he land uh, quite a big fish there. Love was the top-rated running back to sign with Notre Dame since Greg Bryant, and he was the number 79 player in the country and number five running back in the class. Love was also looking at Texas A&M, Alabama, uh, and Oregon, as well as Michigan too. But when you look at the A&M, Alabama, and Oregon parts, especially in the NIL era, those are not recruitments that Notre Dame typically wins, but they won with Love. And then Notre Dame added a grad transfer very late in the game, Devin Ford from Penn State. Uh, Ford was a pretty highly recruited running back out of high school, but he's, he got buried on the depth chart at Penn State. Guys like uh, Nick Singleton came on, and they just simply beat him out. So he hasn't had a ton of – or he has experience at the college level, but he hasn't got a ton of reps lately. But my big takeaways here is that Notre Dame has recruited this position extremely well. If, uh, but if you look at the rankings – I think that would give you the wrong idea. And now I'm probably going to get some people who tell me, well, see, this is why recruiting rankings don't matter. No, that's not the point. Like, overall, yes, you can find some diamonds in the rough, but they weren't, like, you know, outside of the top 500. Logan Diggs was the closest one to that. But, like, Chris Irie was a good recruit. Now he plays wide receiver. But, like, Audrey Kesame was just outside the top 200, number 13 running back. Kyron Williams, obviously the biggest diamond in the rough here. I don't think anyone expected him. Uh, to have the career that he ended up having outside of probably Kyron Williams himself. Honestly, when the first time I saw him, uh, or, uh, saw a picture of him when he was like a f true freshman, he looked pretty fat. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I think if you ask Kyron, uh, he'd probably say the same thing. But then once the COVID pandemic happened, he went home. He just worked and worked and worked and lost, lost a bunch of weight and was truly a workhorse back despite the fact that he kind of lacked size at the position. But Notre Dame has recruited this position really well. I think you got to give Lance Taylor a ton of credit for the work he did after he replaced Autry Denson. Denson was known as a great developer of talent, but really not a good recruiter. And then Taylor proved to be not only a great developer, but a great evaluator of talent because he found these guys, uh, even after they missed on Shipley, it was really, really impressive that they were able to get SMA and Diggs in the same class of taking such a big swing and focusing all of their energy on one guy, really, for the bulk of that recruitment. So once he left, 
took the job, uh, or took the offensive coordinator job at Louisville. Now he's the head coach at Western Michigan. And since Dylan McCullough's come on, he hasn't really skipped a beat since he was hired in February of 2022. Um, he's been recruiting well. And Notre Dame's top two backs this year improved significantly as the season went along. That being said, I'm actually a little concerned about the depth chart heading into 2023, and I'll explain why coming up next. This episode of Lockdown Irish is brought to you by Bird Dogs. I've raved about Bird Dog shorts before in the podcast, and I'm here to do it again because they're just that good. Not only do they make you look better, they're way more comfortable than regular shorts that are made of a stiff, restricting cotton. Bird Dogs fix this issue by inventing cloud net fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. So not only can you wear these shorts in the gym, but you could wear them on the golf course, out to lunch, really wherever you want. So go to birddogs.com slash college, enter promo code college, and they'll even throw in a free Yeti-style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash college for a free Yeti-style tumbler. So get to birddogs.com ASAP, get yourself some new shorts and a nice coffee tumbler to go along with them. And once your shorts arrive, you won't want to take them off. That's a promise. Thanks again for making Locked On Irish your first listen of the day. Today we're looking at the past, present, and future of the Notre Dame running back room. And now let's take a look at the depth chart before the Irish take the field for the start of fall camp in just a couple months. I can't believe it's actually closer than you think, honestly. So if you look at Notre Dame's running back depth chart, the first guy, the first guy is, is pretty obvious, I would say. Uh, that's going to be Audrey Estimate. He's the clear starter. With Logan Diggs gone, this is not a 1A, 1B situation. There is a 1. And there's honestly a pretty significant gap between 1 and 2, in my opinion, or at least as it stands today. So right now, I would say that Jabron Payne is the most probable number two guy at this point in time. He's a retro freshman. He got a little bit of action last year at the end. He got a couple carries against Boston College, but that was pretty much it. Then Jadarian Price is the wild card. He's a retro freshman. He missed all of last season with the torn Achilles, but there was a lot of hype on him coming out of spring practice last year where he was going to be getting the ball last year, and that was in a room that had not only did it have SMA in digs, it also had Chris Tyree who got 100 carries last season, and Janarian Price was going to be beating out all three of them for carries, and then that the injury set him back. Um, so we really don't know what to expect from him this season. I've heard some conflicting things about his recovery. I'll get into that in a second, but for now, he's going to be the third guy. I'm putting Devin Ford at fourth here because – I don't really know what to expect from him this season. There were some rumors that he was going to quit football entirely um, after he left Penn State last season. I know that he was a highly rated prospect coming out of high school, and he did do some good things at the college level. I really don't know what to expect from him because he left after four games after last season and then was in the transfer portal for a long time before ultimately deciding to go to Notre Dame. It could work out, but... I think there's a lot of times here Notre Dame gets guys pretty late in the game with the transfer portal, and it doesn't always go that well. Um, I, I just I don't have super high hopes for Devin Ford this year, but hey, I could be totally wrong on this. So right now I have him fourth, but we'll see. Then you've got Jeremiah Love, the true freshman coming in, and uh, I think that he ha- could have a breakout season this year. He's certainly going to have an opportunity without Logan Diggs. But there's clearly a true one and then a bunch of question marks behind him. And with SMA, Last year, he had 920 rushing yards and 156 carries, which was really good. Okay, that came out to 5.9 yards per carry at 11 touchdowns. Um, he had added 135 yards to the air on nine catches. So he had a really good season last year, and he's going to have to be even better this year for the Irish because he's going to probably get a lot more carries without Diggs and without Tyree at the running back position as well. The most impressive thing about SMA is that he had 569 yards after contact last season. So he averaged 3.65 yards after he was hit every time he touched the ball. So you got to figure with a guy that big and with an offensive line that we think will be that good for Notre Dame, SMA is going to have a really good year. He's probably going to get, I would say, right around 200 carries. If you gave me the over-under, I would probably take the over, although I don't think it's that much of a given because Kyron Williams just had 204 carries in, in 12 games in 2021, and he was the main back. For a while there, he was the only offense Notre Dame had that season, and he barely got over that 200 carries mark. So Hopefully, one of these other guys steps up and is able to take the load off estimate a little bit. But right now, we don't really know who that's going to be. As I said, Payne got a couple carries in garbage time, but that's little to no experience at the college level. Price and Love don't have a single carry at the college level yet, although both of them have high expectations, but they have not done anything yet. So we're going to have to wait and see there. Ford has had 21 total carries since the 2020 season. There's really not of a ton of experience behind SME, and that is what concerns me. The, pe- the pessimist in me would say that we're, uh, we're one injury to SME away from this group being a potential weakness on the roster. Now, the flip side of that, the optimist in me would say that 
These guys will have a great offensive line in front of them, plus a talented quarterback to take the pressure off them. So it doesn't really matter which one of these guys is going to carry the ball because they're talented enough to have success given the talent that's around them. I think it's probably going to be somewhere in the middle, okay? Referring to the two through five guys on the depth chart behind us, me. Um, I think that Jabon Payne certainly showed some flashes in spring practice, but I don't think he's going to be that reliable to hold up for an entire season. We found out that he was hurt last season. I think Dylan McCullough alluded to that during one of his press conferences during spring practice. That would be three straight seasons for him where he was dealing with a semi-significant injury, dating all the way back to his time at LaSalle in high school. Marcus Freeman told Irish Sports Daily recently that Jadarian Price is 100% clear to play. Frankly, I'm, I'm just not buying that. That doesn't check out with anything we've heard or actually seen from Price in spring practice. We know that he was a limited participant. It made perfect sense that he didn't participate in the spring game. But he tore his Achilles, man. That is a really difficult recovery process. So the, the idea that he's all of a sudden 100% just a year removed from that injury and considering he didn't do all that much in spring practice, I find that really hard to believe. I also think that... Marcus Freeman might be taking a page out of the Brian Kelly dictionary when it comes to talking about injuries. Remember when Brian Kelly talked about Blake Fisher and said he was going to be okay or, or the injury wasn't that serious, and then he ended up missing the whole season? And then you got the whole Kyle Hamilton thing where, God, I'm drawing a blank right now how he described that injury, but it was it was such a weird way to describe it. And he's never really been that honest or that forthcoming about players' injuries, and he doesn't really have any reason to be, but we saw a little bit of that from Marcus Freeman last season. Speaking of which, I think I, I've got this burnt lip. I've got, I think I'm bleeding in the lip. I'm going to keep this in, whatever. I'm just playing through pain, podcasting through the elements here, but it's starting to get annoying. Anyway, we will press on in this podcast. Uh, where what? Jeremiah Love. Okay, he could have a breakout season. Honestly, of all the position groups in football, it's probably easiest for a freshman running back to not only see the field but excel because – I mean, they obviously have to learn the offense. They need to know where they need to be, where they need to block, the keys and different things like that. But it's a lot easier. Like, there's a lot less for a running back to have to learn than, say, a cornerback or a safety or a quarterback or a wide receiver um, because we saw the issues with that last year with Tobias Merriweather. So all these guys are going to have a chance to step up this year behind SMA. And there's a real possibility that all my concerns that I just mentioned about the depth, the injuries, all of that will look stupid a few months from now. There's, I, I'm, I'm admitting that now. So if someone takes this clip and brings it back uh, in the fall when Notre Dame's running all over teams and Payne's getting in and Price is getting in and Love's breaking out, I'm saying right now I could be wrong. But there's also a possibility that all my concerns will be validated because we frankly don't have enough from these running backs to prove that they're going to be really solid at the college level outside of Estime, obviously. This is all about the guys behind them. So I think Estime is going to have a really good year so long as he stays healthy, so long as he's able to endure all the you know tackles and all the big hits he takes. He's not, even though that he initiates the blow on a lot of this stuff, he's in some violent collisions because he's just that big and it takes that much force to bring him down. So it's sort of a give and take there, but I think he's going to have a really good season and I think Notre Dame just needs one of these guys it too would be great, but they really just need one of these guys to really step up and be a solid number two this season. Uh, if I had to guess, I think the safest bet would be Payne, but I also think that uh, J- J- Jadarian Price or Jeremiah Love is going to really step up this year, uh, assuming that they're both healthy and they're given the, opp- the opportunity. So even though I might be a little bit concerned about the depth of, of the position for this season, I'm really, really excited about the future of the Notre Dame running backs, and I'll tell you why after this message. All right, so obviously I've talked a lot about running back recruiting lately, given the fact that Notre Dame just picked up a commitment from four-star running back Kedron Young out of Texas, and he's a damn good player. Uh, He's the number 14 running back in the class, and now with him and four-star Aeneas Williams from Missouri, Notre Dame's set in the class of 2024 as it pertains to the running backs. They got two. I don't expect them to take transfer after this year, even if SMA does leave uh, for the NFL, which I think he will. It just makes... Too much sense for running backs to leave for the NFL uh, when they've proven that they can play and they're still young and relatively healthy because we all know the toll that playing running back takes on these guys. So assuming Estime has as good of a season as we think he can and he goes to the NFL, I still think that with Young and Williams on board in this class, they're going to have plenty of talented running backs next year, assuming that one of the other guys that I was just talking about in the previous segment doesn't, doesn't leave. And again, you know, I'm not trying to be a pessimist. I'm just pointing out the fact that you really never know in this era of college football who's going to stay and who's going to go because we get surprised time in and time again about guys who you think are solid 
they end up leaving for whatever the case may be, even if they're playing, like Logan Diggs transferred um, after he was a very key back last year and was definitely going to be getting a lot of carries this season. So you really don't know. But I think that with these two guys on board, they're going to have plenty of guys on their roster next year that are talented. And there's going to be some really, really good competition for who's going to get the bulk of the carries next season. Now, some of that is probably going to shape up or shape out this year based on who steps up uh, in the 2023 season. But then you've got these two talented guys. And I've talked about it before on this podcast. The reports I'm hearing about Young is that he's going to be ready to play day one. He's playing some really good competition in Texas. He's physically ready to go. And that would be really good for Notre Dame if they get more fresh and running backs who are ready to play. Because I mentioned Nick Singleton earlier. It's not that crazy to think that a guy uh, and that doesn't even mention his counterpart, Allen, at Penn State. Collectively, they make they make up for one of the best running back tandems in the entire country, and they're both going to be true sophomores this season. So Notre Dame is set uh, for the 2024 class. They've got some offers out in the 2025 class. No commitments right now. It's obviously very early in that, in that cycle, but Dylan McCullough now has the luxury of getting a head start on that class and putting a lot more attention into guys in the 2025 class and then just sort of maintaining Young and Williams' commitment, which I think he will have no problem keeping them. Those guys seem pretty set in stone for Notre Dame. So hopefully he's able to use that time to get, uh, you know, make a, to build a stronger relationship with a five star, really top end guy or a guy that McCullough really, really wants because he's shown already that he is a good eye for talent too. Lance Taylor had a great eye for talent. And now Dylan McCullough shown that he does as well. He was the one raving about Jadarian Price after spring practice. So I think that's really encouraging to see. And all the reports on Young and Williams is that they're both pretty underrated for their ranking, even though they're rated pretty highly in the class. So my big takeaways here for Notre Dame's running backs is that they've done a fantastic job not only at recruiting, uh, but developing. And then that has resulted in great play on the field over the past five seasons. I've already mentioned how good Kyron Williams was. Audrey Estimate could be even better. Or that might be a little bit premature to say. Let's see what Estimate can do this season. But I think Notre Dame's running back room, even though I've mentioned some concerns about the depth this year, I could easily be proven wrong. There's a lot of talent in that room, so that's certainly not the issue. There's guys who can probably do it. I just got to see it before I can say confidently that this is going to be an elite group. And uh, the future might be even brighter, which is crazy because it's been so good. But then you add in a guy like Jeremiah Love and the athleticism that he has, the caliber of player that he could be at the college level, not just running the ball, but catching passes. Um, Coming out of high school, there was a chance that he could even play receiver at the next level. So I'm really, really excited about what Notre Dame can do in the future. If I had any questions or concerns, really the only one would be that Deal McCullough is probably going to leave at some point in the relatively near future, not before this season, obviously, but it certainly could happen uh, after this season. Um, He's coached in the NFL before. He even has a Super Bowl ring from his time with the Kansas City Chiefs. He's also been on record saying that he wants to be a head coach one day at the college level. Um, I think that's what he said when he left Indiana to come to Notre Dame, that he felt like it better positioned him to ultimately become a head coach one day. And look, I get it. He's a he's a really successful assistant coach at the college level. But if you want to become a head coach, you're not going to do that by being a running backs coach forever, even though he's really damn good at his job. So I really hope he stays. But it wouldn't surprise me if he left. He was getting some interest this past offseason. It was good to see that he stuck around with Notre Dame. And I think that he recognizes that he has a really good situation on hand in South Bend. But there's always the possibility that someone offers him an offensive coordinator position. And frankly, it would probably be dumb to turn it down depending on the circumstances. So I think that Notre Dame, the, the talent on the room, which is the most important thing, honestly, is, is great. The future looks great. I think Notre Dame is going to be in really good shape for a long time. If I did have a concern, it would be Dylan McCullough. But look, that's just the nature of college football. Assistant coaches come and go, especially from college to the NFL when they get a really good opportunity because guess what? Most of these college coaches, they don't want to kiss 16-year-olds' ass all the time. Recruiting gets old. It gets old quickly, even if you're really good at it. It's just not that fun. It's a messy business. And uh, as much as I love talking about it and covering it on the show – Honestly, it was nice to have a little bit of a break today and talk about the guys who are on the team and not some 17-year-olds out there who I really don't know if they're going to pan out or not because guess what? No one really knows. So Notre Dame's in good shape with the running backs. I will continue doing this with every other position group on the roster throughout the rest of the summer. But that is going to do it for me today. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. I will not be releasing an episode tomorrow. I've got a work event uh, tonight, and I won't have a chance to record until tomorrow. So I'll have a new episode out first thing in the morning on Friday, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, remember to subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Follow the show on Twitter at Lockdown Irish, on Instagram at Lockdown Irish Pod, and my personal Twitter account at Tyler, W-O-J-C-I-A-K. 
I'll talk to you guys on Friday.